course, reminding us of the close links and the loving links that we have with our parent church in Durham. And um, so Benjamin's preaching there today. Phil is preaching for us. We've already had a blessed Lord's uh, Day service this morning. And uh, Phil, we would love you to take our greetings back to the folk and tell them how much we think of you and are grateful for you all. So we'll take a few minutes, uh, a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship and then the Reverend Phil Baden will lead us in our worship this evening. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. We're going to sing from Christian hymns, hymn number 45, hymn number 45, God is in his temple, hymn number 45. Let's continue in praising God as we bow before him with our prayers. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we come before you to praise your name, to glorify you, to exalt you, to declare in the midst of this congregation that you 
and you alone are God. We pray with thanksgiving for all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. For by nature we are children of wrath, deserving of your judgment to come upon us because of our many sins. But in Christ you have loved us and he gave himself for us. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is a glorious, sweet exchange that is remarkable in our sight. And we come with joy and with great thanksgiving that these things are true and they are true for us. So Lord, would you receive the praises of your people this evening that as we gather we may come in spirit and in truth with reverence and with awe to bow before you our maker and our redeemer and that you would be merciful to us in coming among us by your Holy Spirit. Come and dwell among us, we pray, and glorify yourself. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hear the word of God from the book of Revelation and chapter 21. Um, it's from verse 9 to the end of the chapter that I would like to draw your attention to, but the opening of the chapter is glorious as well, so we'll read the whole chapter. Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. She also had twelve, sorry, she also had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. 
And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. We sing from the Psalter and Psalm 27. And the first six verses from Sing Psalm, Psalm 27 and the first six verses.
come now to a time of prayer in which we'll pray for the world in which we live. And as John has already intimated, we'll be praying for the uh, pregnancy advice centers, uh, particularly after the events of uh, this week. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we praise you who has created all things and who is the one who knit us together in our mother's wombs, who knows us from before we were born. And we thank you that you have called us to yourself in the Lord Jesus, that the curse of sin and death has been placed upon our Lord And he died in our place and we have been raised with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. We do thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit poured out upon your church. And we ask, O Lord, that you would help us as we come now with our prayers. That you would hear us and that you would answer us in the way in which you will it. As we come before you now, we do pray for the nation in which we live, particularly for those that you have placed in authority. Oh Lord our God, as we come before you, we cry out to you that you would grant to us leaders, both elected in Westminster, but also their advisors, who are people of wisdom and people of integrity who would seek the good of the people of this nation and that that good that they seek would be reflective of your will and your revealed law. O Lord our God, that is a great prayer that we are praying, but you are the God who can do impossible things. And so we pray, O Lord, that those in our government, those in the royal family who do not know your name, would repent and turn in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those in our government, and for those who hold them to account in parliament, who do know the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, O Lord, that you would encourage them, that you would build them up, and that you would give them the right words to say at the right time as they carry out their duties. We pray, although not in Scotland ourselves, we do pray for the leadership election of the Scottish National Party, where one who worships in a church very close to our own uh, is now being shown by the media and this has that spotlight upon her we pray that during these things that she would grow in her love and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would support her and uphold her through these days But, oh Lord, there are many who will be carrying out their duties as uh, civil servants or local councillors who you know. And we ask that you would help them as they go about the duties that you have given them. But, Lord our God, as we pray those things, it is with a, a recognition of how far so much of our society has gone away from you. Oh Lord, we are not surprised by this. Your word does not give us any present guarantees. We know that your church is going to be persecuted, that it will encounter suffering and opposition. But Lord God, we do pray for your protection. And we do pray particularly for the work that is going on in the pregnancy advice centers. Oh Lord, we do thank you for the media exposure that took place this week. It was meant as an attack, but 
It has revealed the truths of abortion. And so we pray that you would be with the workers in those centers and protect them. We also pray that you would give them confidence in you so that they may continue to carry out their work without fear and without suspicion. And we pray for those who would have read the reports or seen the programs that they would see the truth and come to understand what a great sin it is um, to murder the unborn. We pray for those who feel that that is their only option and ask, O oh Lord, that you would be merciful and be pleased to draw them to yourself. O oh Lord our God, we pray that you would help us as we live in this world, that we would be a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would be the name on our lips more than anything else. That even though it would be so easy to be tempted away into political things or good and necessary fights, but that those things might fill our whole horizon, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would keep us from that, but that our eyes would be focused upon the Lord Jesus and then would you help us to live for you in all that we do and in every circumstance that we find ourselves. For we may find it difficult as your people in the world of work to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and to stand firm upon his word. Help us, we pray. We may find it difficult to witness to our friends, our neighbors, our work colleagues, our family members who have no background in the things of Scripture and, and do not understand where it is we position ourselves because of the fact we believe in you. Help us, O oh Lord. Give us the right words to say at the right time. May you use us as salt and light in this world. May we be a a beacon to this world in which we live. And we do pray for those that we love who do not know you. Oh Lord, have mercy. Call them to yourself, we pray. Open up their hearts. Take them from darkness into your glorious light. For only you can do this, O oh Lord. We pray that you would make your home in the hearts of men and women of our generation and that we would see glorious things in these days. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us as we continue in our worship now. You know our joys. You know our sorrows. You know those things that we are particularly struggling with with at this moment and we pray O oh Lord that you would help us in all these things that your word would speak to every heart in this church so that as we leave today we may leave knowing that we have met with you in your word and that you have spoken a word that is life-giving O oh Lord our God, hear our prayers and glorify your name here among us. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing from the Psalter again. And Psalm 132 in Sing Psalms. Psalm 132, we'll sing the whole of the psalm. Um, speaking of the covenant made with David, 
uh, but also about how David was told that he would not build the temple, but one of his sons would do so. Uh, we sing him Psalm 132 in Sing Psalms.
and if you have your Bibles, please do open them to Ezekiel and chapter 40. And it will be quite important that you have a Bible if you have one in reach. Uh, as our text this evening is chapter 40, chapter 41, chapter 42, and half of chapter 43. Now, at Durham, I did read all of those in one service, but I split it in two over the two readings, and I haven't done that tonight. So we're only going to get a couple of places, but you need to have your Bibles open because I'm going to be referring to parts of those chapters as we go through tonight. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So what I'm going to read just now are the first five verses of chapter 40 and then the first 12 verses of chapter 43. So Ezekiel chapter 40 and the first five verses going to chapter 43 and the first 12 verses. In the 25th year of our captivity... At the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it, towards the south, was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, each being a cubit and a hand breadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod, and the height, one rod. And then chapter 43 in the first 12 verses. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. Visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kabar. And I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, nor they nor their kings by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. When they set their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with a wall between them and me, they defiled my holy name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings far away from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they're ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangement, its exits and its entrances, its entire design and all its ordinances, all its forms and all its laws. 
write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. Amen. The area of architecture is a really fascinating area to study. Uh, And it has a, a rich history to which you can study. And it pays for studying architecture because you can come to a building and you can look at it and you can understand what's going on. And you can, maybe within the field of architecture, you can make some narrower specialisms within that. You can become an expert at such glorious buildings as that one out there, a beautiful example of modernism, maybe even close to brutalism in that building there, and I'm sure all of you love that building. But you can also learn from architecture that these columns here are Corinthian, but those there are Doric. You can understand that uh, there is a representation just above those Doric columns of the triglyphs and the gut eye. And you can show your knowledge by saying words like triglyphs and gut eye and hope people have no idea what you're talking about so you look a little cleverer. But the chapters that we're looking at tonight are an architectural pattern. We're introduced in the opening verses of chapter 40 to this man who appears to Ezekiel with a measuring rod in his hand. And what then happens, we heard one verse of it, verse 5, where he measures the wall which surrounds the city which Ezekiel sees in a vision. And then if you continue on reading, maybe just have a look at the, if you have them, the head, headers in your Bibles, he goes to describe, firstly, the eastern gateway to the temple. And he measures it all out and tells you how wide the door is and the various niches that are there in this vestibule as you go in to the temple precincts. He then goes to the outer court. The first part of the temple is you go in through the wall, measures it all out, shows you what is there. And then not only does he show you the eastern gateway, he also tells you about the northern gateway and the southern gateway and the gateways of then the inner court because not only is there an outer court but there's a, an inner court in which also has gates in the east, the north and the south. He'll show you where there are places for the priests to change their clothes and to do the sacrifices and prepare them. He'll measure all these other places until he comes into the temple itself. The temple proper, the building which contains, well, we'll see what it contains. But that temple building itself, he'll measure it out and he'll describe what it looks like. And then he will measure out the places where the priests carry out their work. And then, at the end of chapter 42, he will give you the measurements of the whole city that Ezekiel sees. Now, how many of us, when we've come to these words in our daily reading or whatever it is, come to this and we scratch our heads and say, what on earth is going on? What is this architectural plan all about? Why has this been given to us in Scripture? Why is it and what is it that is being said here? Now, just as the study of architecture can help in us understanding a building, it was for a particular purpose that Corinthian columns and Doric columns have been used in this building. 
There's a language behind all those things that the architect was drawing upon and saying something to the world through that language. It's the same way here. God is speaking to us in this architectural plan. But unlike an architectural plan for all saints, where you can look at the floor plan and you can look at the elevations and you could rebuild, this is not quite the same. People have tried. You can go online and you can find all sorts of pictures of Ezekiel's temple. But in a number of these places, you're missing dimensions for the vertical. And so it would be impossible to build this temple. So what is going on here? Well, as we come to these things, I want us to come to it knowing that in this, as in so much, if not all Old Testament prophecies, there are various horizons There is the first horizon, which is the word given for the people of the day. What would these words have meant to those who heard Ezekiel give this message? But then, of course, we know that these things are pointing forward. And so the second horizon I want us to look at is that horizon of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming into the world, which, you may not believe me just now, But I hope to show you that these architectural plans point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, and you may have picked up on this one from the reading from Revelation 21, there's a third horizon, which is the end of all things and the new heavens and the new earth that are being spoken of in these words given to Ezekiel. So let's firstly deal with the horizon of Ezekiel. What did this mean for the people of Ezekiel's time? Now let's put this in context. Ezekiel is one of those who was taken away from Judah in the first exile as Nebuchadnezzar first came against Judah and took away the great and the good and established his own puppet king there. And Ezekiel, we're told, aren't we, given the time, 25 years before this um, this vision was given him, he was brought into captivity and then he was given a vision of the Lord God and he was set apart for the work of being a prophet. And in the early part of his ministry as a prophet, the word that he had to say to Judah was almost unrelentingly a message of judgment. He was saying to the people again and again and again, thus says the Lord, because of your sins, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And he said this in a variety of ways. God gave him various visions, gave him various things to act out. One of them was to build the city of Jerusalem in the mud and enact a siege of that city. But one of the visions that he had was that he was taken into the temple in Jerusalem and he was shown what was going on there. And he was shown that the priests and the people of Jerusalem had completely abandoned the Lord their God, had gone after other gods, and were mired in sin. And following on from that vision, Ezekiel saw a vision of the Lord leaving the temple. The glory of the Lord which had come down upon the temple in the days of Solomon so that the Lord said, this is where I will put my name. I will live here, as it were. That glory, Ezekiel sees, he sees that glory leave from the east gate of the temple. And what comes next? the destruction of Jerusalem. 
Everything that Ezekiel has been talking about comes to pass. Everything that the Lord has said through him is fulfilled as Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city, brings the temple down, and everything is destroyed. Now after that, Ezekiel gets some good news visions and words to speak to the people. I think the last time I was here, we looked at the shepherds of Israel in previous chapters to this, of how the Lord will be their shepherd and how he will bring them back to the land. And so hope after the destruction of Judah is now a note of his preaching. And so that's the context in which this vision comes. 14 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, when a people are there in Babylon, in their exile, and perhaps they're beginning to question whether those things that Ezekiel had said to them previously were ever going to come to pass. Is God going to be our shepherd? Is he going to come back to us? Is he going to lead us back to our land and our city? Or is this it now? Are we a demoralized people whose God has abandoned them? And God responds to this with an architectural plan. Now, you and I might sit and read these things and go, what on earth is this about? But for the people who heard Ezekiel give this vision, this is an absolutely remarkable thing to hear. This is something that would have thrilled their souls. For what Ezekiel is doing is showing that God has not abandoned them. But we're also told another reason for what God is doing. Did you hear it? It was there in chapter 43. And verse 10. Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. The reason why God gave this vision to Ezekiel was to assure them that he had not abandoned them, but also to give them this vision so that they could see the depth of their previous sin and turn from it. Now those are the two things that we need to bear in mind as we come and look at the details of this temple. Because you and I might still be seeing just a, an architectural plan and trying to work out what on earth a vestibule is and what are the jams in a door and, and how is this to be done, what does it mean? Well, as you look through these things, you'll notice a a couple of things. Firstly, you'll see that there are gates. There are four gates into the city. And that in itself is an interesting note. Because this city wall, or the temple wall, the two words seem to be used concurrently in this chapter, That wall is huge in comparison to what was there before. Um, Elders, may I show a visual aid? I know that's not quite what we do, but here it is. Um, This is my visual aid for you. Um, For those of you who are American, this is an American football field. If you're British, add a little bit of a width to it, but the length is the same. This small rectangle is the tabernacle given in the days of Moses. This is Solomon's temple. This is the temple given at the time of Jesus, built by Herod the Great. And this is Ezekiel's temple. Can you see the scale? It's huge. It's massive. It wouldn't fit on the real estate that's available on the hill of Zion in Jerusalem. And there are only four gates. 
In fact, they're not four gates. What am I talking about? You've noticed that mistake, haven't you? There are only three gates on the east, on the north, and on the south. And those gates, in comparison with much else in the temple, are reasonably narrow. The threshold, look at verse 6, of the gateway was one rod wide. And that rod is what? It's six cubits long, but this is the cubit of the temple, so-called, where a cubit, 18 inches, is added to by a hand's breadth, so it's more like 22, 21, 22 inches. So six of those in a, in a line. Giant wall, smallish gateway. And in that gateway, as you go in, there is a sort of room that is there with three niches on either side, which would be likely to be used by doormen to guard the entrance into the city. Now, what is this speaking to us of? Well, it's speaking of protection. It is speaking uh, of, most importantly, holiness. This is a holy place. It is not open to all, it seems. And anyone who comes has to come through these narrow gates to find the narrow way into the city. And what they'll find there as they come in are some steps. Uh, We're told, um, yes, in verse 22, in the description of the northern gateway, that there are seven steps. So not only are you going in through this narrow way, but you are going upwards as you come in. And again, what's that about? It's, again, remembering that this is the place, the temple, where God is. And so you are moving upwards to God. And you see that as you come into the outer court, To get to the place where the sacrifices take place, you have to go further in, into the inner court in which you find the temple. And there again, you have to climb up some steps with again three gates, eastern, north, and south. But these gates have eight steps And in these places, you will see the places where the sacrifices will take place. Look at chapter 40, verse 38 onwards. Chambers where the burnt offerings are washed before they're placed on the altar. Two tables on one side, two on another, where things are prepared for the sacrifices. And so... In this temple building that Ezekiel sees, we are seeing the need still of sacrifice. Hold these things in your mind. And then we go up into the temple itself. And to get into the temple, verse 49, we see that there are Ten steps. Onwards and upwards. This vision of the temple is a vision of God coming down and the people approaching the Lord through the sacrifices that take place there in the temple. And so what does this mean? You and I are hearing these descriptions of how these things are to be made. But what does it mean to those who heard this for the first time? Well, it's hope for them that God is going to restore them to the land. 
and that he has not abandoned them, that he will remain in fellowship with them, that those sacrifices which deal with their sin will take place once again and they can have that fellowship with him. And to confirm all this, we flick over to chapter 43 and verse 4. After reminding us that this is like the vision he saw when God left the temple, he tells us what he sees now. Verse 4, the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. Think of this, friends, what this means. Ezekiel's fallen on his face because of the glory of the Lord. It's coming back. He abandoned us, he did, he left us. It was because of our sin and he has punished us as we deserved. But now he is coming back. He has not left us forever. He is going to dwell in the midst of us again. I will dwell, verse seven, in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Israel is the place where I am going to live. I have not abandoned you. And see the perfection of this pattern. It's a perfect square for the city from above and all the other measurements are perfect in their own way. It's a vision of beauty, perfection, holiness that greets Ezekiel's eyes that he has to tell the people. To tell them, Look, our God is a God of perfection and holiness and he is the one that is going to dwell among us. So be ashamed for your former sins and turn away from them and live for him. It's just an architectural plan we might think, but no. It's a promise from the God of Israel that he will dwell among his people. That people that he had come away from for a season. He's going to restore, he's going to bring them home, and he is going to dwell among them. Can you see how these chapters might be an encouragement to the people of Israel living in Babylon? Friends, I'd, I'd really encourage you to read the last eight, nine chapters of Ezekiel, chapter 40 to the end of the book. Uh, we did that together, Kerry and I and a few friends we read the whole of Ezekiel over two sessions and we got to the end of it and we just scratched our head and said, what on earth is that about? Well, this is partly what it's about. God promising to come to his people, to dwell in their midst as the holy and righteous God of a holy and righteous people. Now, I hope you're holding all these things in your mind and you're seeing where I'm going the next horizon. Friends, if you know your Bibles, you know that the people do go back to the land. Babylon falls, the Persian Empire is raised up in its place. King Cyrus decrees that the Jews can go back and rebuild the temple, but it takes an age. And then when it finally does get rebuilt, people cry over it because it's nowhere near what was there before. And the prophets of that time continue to say, look, repent, turn to God, be a holy people for a holy God. And this vision that Ezekiel sees doesn't seem to come to pass. Well, friends, this is because this was never, as I've said, meant to be an architectural plan for a literal temple in a literal place. For one thing, I don't think it could fit in Jerusalem in a way that would make any kind of sense without leveling a whole load of hills. But it is speaking of greater truths. That God would come and dwell among his people and that he would provide the sacrifices for them to enter into that temple through the narrow way and for them to be a holy people. And friends, does this not remind us of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ? Does it not 
remind us of that glorious opening of the Gospel of John. Turn there with me, John chapter 1. And verse 14, and see in this verse all the themes of this chap- these chapters in Ezekiel coming into just one man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, after the service, go and speak to David Mathis, Ronaldo, any of the other students at the seminary, and they will tell you that the Greek word there for dwelt, do you know this, David? Is tabernacled. Sorry, I put you on the spot there. Forgive me. Tabernacled. Tabernacle. The tabernacle was given to God's people so that he could dwell among them in the midst of the wilderness. The temple was the tabernacle made of stone so he could dwell in Jerusalem with his people. The vision that Ezekiel saw was the glory of God coming back to Israel and dwelling in the midst of his people. Jesus Christ tabernacled among his people. He took on flesh and dwelt among us. And what is it that John says? We have seen his glory. What did Ezekiel see in his vision? The glory of God returning to Israel. So friends, as you read the architectural plan, what you're seeing is the work of Jesus Christ. You're seeing him come as that one who would be God in all his glory coming and dwelling among his people taking on our flesh and as you see in that temple the parts of the temple where the priests would do the sacrifices and bring the blood into the various areas what you're seeing there is the once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and when you see in later chapters the priests themselves wearing their most holy garments You are seeing there the Lord Jesus Christ as the great high priest who entered into the holiest of holies, not made with hands, but in the heavenly places, and he went in there with his own blood. It's just a pattern on how to make a temple. No, it's more than that, friends. It's the finished work of Christ for your salvation. It is what God had planned to do from the very beginning, laid out in the things of vestibules and courts and gateways and altars and temple buildings. The Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory, humbling himself. And friends, what does Jesus Christ say to us? He says, strive to enter by the narrow way. For that's the way to life. The wide road is the road to destruction, but the narrow way is the way to life. And that narrow way is faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The wide way is that wide road that the people of Israel took of the worship of the gods of other lands, the elevating of idols. But the narrow way is the way of Jesus Christ. Will you walk that narrow way? Will you see what God has done in coming and dwelling among us? His glory has come and we've seen it in the person of Jesus Christ. But now, friends, if that isn't glorious enough for you, let me take you to the final horizon, which is the horizon of the world to come. But I keep doing this. I give us three horizons, but... I keep forgetting there's sort of a two and a half horizon because of the finished work of Christ as he comes and dwells among us and then he's going up into heavens awaiting the day when he comes again. God still dwells with his people. Jesus going up into heaven is not like the glory leaving the temple in in Ezekiel's first vision. For as we heard this morning, from heaven, 
God sends his Holy Spirit upon his church and he dwells with his people. Not in a building made of stone, but in our hearts. Isn't that remarkable? The glory of God has come and he does dwell with his people. And he is with us and he is with us forever. Which leads us to the final horizon for tonight the horizon of the world to come. It was no accident that John saw a city come down from heaven, the new Jerusalem. It was no accident that who met him in that vision was a man with a measuring rod. It's no accident that it was a perfect square. It was no accident that there were actually 12 gates this time rather than three because rather than being a vision just to Israel, it's a vision for the whole world and all tribes and tongues and languages and nations are going to come in to this glorious new creation. But do you remember what was missing from that great vision of the end of time and the end of all things? A couple of things actually, but the big one for our purposes today was that there was no temple. It's a city, just as Ezekiel saw, but at the center of it is not a temple. Why? Because God would dwell in the midst of the city. And no longer do we need a a signpost to God when that day comes, which is what the tabernacle was and what the temple was, but he's actually going to be there. And we won't need any more sacrifices to take place because the once and for all sacrifice has taken place on the cross with Jesus Christ. So there is no need for a temple to be built in this world or the world to come. Contrary to our premillennial friends. God is going to dwell in the midst of his people. He is going to dwell with us for eternity. On that great day when Jesus Christ comes with the clouds, with all his angels, when the dead will be raised, and down from heaven comes the new Jerusalem. This vision that Ezekiel sees of the glory of God coming back is a vision of that glorious future. Still shadowy, still a pattern of what's to come, but it speaks of the reality of how God will come and dwell with his people forever. That day is coming. It's guaranteed. And the Lord God is going to bring us to that moment. And you will know peace and blessedness for all eternity. And all the sorrows of this world will pass away and there will be no more tears. Friends, the people of Israel in Babylon, they were a demoralized people. They were a people surrounded by idolaters, by false religion, by a people who didn't understand their language or their culture. And friends, we may think that we are in a similar place. Peter, in his letter, his first letter, writes to the church that is in exile, the diaspora, the church in Babylon, Because we are in a similar position, aren't we? In the midst of a culture that doesn't understand us or Christ or the things of God or how we live our lives. And it could be very easy for us to be demoralized. But friends, the vision has been given us of the new heavens and the new earth that are coming. And the reality of that future has already been given us by the gift of the Spirit. He dwells in his church and in us right now. And all this is guaranteed because of what happened in Jesus Christ coming and tabernacling among us, living among us as he does today and will do forever. So there you have it, an architectural plan for a temple that speaks of glorious spiritual truths for each and every one of us. And to God be the glory. Amen. Our last hymn is...
453. 653. I can't read my own writing. I hope that didn't cause you too much confusion if that's how I sent it to you. Um, 653. Love divine, all loves excelling. Which speaks of that dwelling of the Lord in our own hearts even today. But looking forward to when we will be changed from glory into glory. 653. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.